Okay, well, we're going to get started because we've got a lot to get through. Um, I just want to thank everyone that's here participating. Uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, I think I, I explained this well to the four panelists, but um, within uh, Indiana, we have a group that's called the SARE Advisory Council, and SARE is the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. You have it in every one of your states, so if you don't know about it, definitely um, reach out to them. Great. Uh, we've got a great group of um, people that are on our advisory council, and one of the things that we decided was that we wanted to have some DEI training um, of for our advisory council. And then we opened it up to anyone in Indiana. Um, so we have other people that are gonna be on as well uh, from extension predominantly, but there might be people from NRCS and um, possibly from the Hoosier Young Farmer Coalition. I'm not quite sure who all is here, but um, uh, hopefully they can kind of introduce themselves later as they're, as they're moving, uh, as we move forward. Um, but I just want to uh, yeah, start, let me just make sure I get all this stuff cleared off so I see what I'm doing. Um, and, and so yeah, the title today is, um, it's, it's a DEI webinar, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, but our, our title for today is a panelist of, uh, of socially disadvantaged is how USDA assigns the term for BIPOC. I'm not sure if I really like that name, but um, it is what the name is. And um, it's it's uh, what we would say it would be BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And one of the things that we're really wanting to do is to hear from uh, different people that work with uh, a different minority groups and how we can be better at um, being more inviting, engaging, open, and um, uh, equitable in our programs, in particular in the state of Indiana. So with that, I'm going to um, start moving forward. As you know, we have a um, uh, a statement for um, the civil rights. We are required to put this up here, um, understand it, understandably so, why we should do it, um, both in English and in Spanish. Um, and I want to just get started right off the bat. We've got four panelists. We put you guys in alphabetical order, so there wasn't any reason why I passed you your first otherwise, other than we're really happy to have you here. Um, but Pastor, um, Pastor Mang is from Myanmar, Myanmar, and he works in Indianapolis. He works with uh, quite a few community gardens um, in the area. And um, I, I think most of you have seen his bio that we've sent out. Um, I'm not going to talk about too much of everything here. He's done a whole a lot of stuff. Uh, he's got more titles to your name than I think I've seen on anyone. You are very, very well educated. So, Pastor, I don't know. Um, I feel a little bit intimidated with how much uh, knowledge you have <laughs> that you're bringing here. So I'm just going to um, pass this over to you, and I will actually push the slide. So if you want to tell me, you know, to pass them, I sure surely will. But um, thank you again for being on our panel. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you everyone for the, having me today. And I am originally from Myanmar. I've been here for 21 years and Indiana was the first state I landed. And I was in New York for two years and back to Indiana and living with my family. And uh, I'm passionate the helping community members to do uh, farming gardening. It's not a big project, but it's helpful. The, because there are main thing is organic food choice. And uh, coming from the undeveloped country, uh, the newcomers, they don't know the, the impact, negative impact, potential negative impact of the using chemical fertilizers. And there are a lot of food choices. That's one thing I'm interested in. Uh, the organic gardening training offered by Purdue University Agricultural Department. Another thing, second thing is that our people, those uh, migrants group came from farming background. They love farming, gardening. And uh, I myself grew up in a small village where my parents were farming. So when I touched the ground, the earth, play with mud, and that connect me back home. And it's good for my mind. And uh, also, these immigrants are very isolated they, within their own community. So when we have community gardening, so it 
coming together, a fellowship, a social well-being, and also productivity is a really good thing. So what we did say, Purdue University Agriculture Department came and trained us how to do uh, the per- uh, organic gardening. So uh, in a church compound, we do like more than 10 families. It's the second year we've been trained how to do the organic seeding and a soil testing and putting organic soil and also uh, what the season, uh, particular time and season and what crops are good for what time. And then also they train us how we can increase product productivity. And they also train us how to preserve food, greens and vegetables and what's the best kind of food we can preserve and without harming our own health. So that's a good thing. And also they also train us tree pruning, fruit tree pruning. We love planting apples and uh, other vegetable pears. And so uh, they train us how to do the pruning. So without pruning, the tree doesn't bear that much good. So uh, it's helpful. So we have a sample gardening at our chart compound and it's the second year we've been working on and we'll be working next year again. So they also have the small project of grants helping us uh, buying the soil and the seed and uh, volunteers hiring uh, gardening project uh, experts. So those are really helpful. And we do video and I just send online and uh, send to the community, other people, not only the 10, more than the 10 to 15 family, but the whole community. We have like 20 to 25,000 Myanmar uh, refugee population here south side Indianapolis. So mostly, and to some extent, they do backyard gardening and farming vegetable. They grow vegetable. And there are some, some of vegetable items that are not available in America that they eat in far back home. So we order and some, we call it some talk. It's not American name or any other name. You will know. <laughs> they like it and they grow it and it connect them. It's good for not only for physical, but also mental, social being, and uh, feel home about that. So that's a really good thing. And there are some items that are not available here in America, and they, uh, we order them, and uh, that we make that happen. So, and uh, next thing, what the we need, uh, I see that a lot more training. We need that, and our Purdue University Agricultural Department uh, do translate document and uh, instruction training material in Burmese and Chilean language. There are different dialects in Burmese immigrants. Uh, so we use translation and we distribute the online social network and printed copy to community members so they can benefit how, what time to grow, what crops and what's the good and what's how to preserve the food and what's the best to eat and most maximum vitamin contain. And next thing, what we need is that tra- a lot of training, we need that. And, and uh, the, also, if there's a small grain, uh, the people, they are low incomers, so they don't have enough money to invest in soil, buying soil and seed and particular other items and uh, scientifically doing, but uh, they, they know uh, locally how to grow this table, but they don't really don't want to invest a lot of things. So uh, sometimes uh, they buy a lot of chemicals and fertilizers and put it and they eat. We love to eat raw vegetables. So it, I think, it is sometimes uh, dangerous to the health of the body uh, when we eat, especially raw, uh, that produce with the chemicals and fertilizers. So yes, if there's any more, uh, training and uh, go to their own places. They have churches network, religious community and community networking. So offer them where we can help them. Offer them a small grant. It's not big money, but it's a small grant, but that helps. And uh, after they settle how to do, yeah, they been, they know how to grow this table, but this different environment, the climate has changed, environment changes. So there are a lot of things they have to learn, especially like healthy food, organic, preservation and growing so that will help them uh, live a uh, feel home and this is uh, where they, they will be 
So uh, this is a good thing. Purdue University across the department has offered this two years project. We will continue next year again. We plan to do that. And uh, this is really, I'm really happy. I've been here 20 years for Indiana. So this is the first time we ever did that. Uh, we, we came to contact with them. So I am so excited. I just to go to, I, I also own one plot. I, I, I did myself and uh, we love that. And this is really helpful in the future. This should be a growing thing we engage. Not only that with the vegetable, the food thing is they help them engage, come out of the home, isolated, and they have fellowship with other people. And uh, then they feel home that people are carrying us and training us what we need. It's day-to-day, every day eat like chilies and mustard leaves and soy leaves. And it's everyday table. So whenever they eat, they do remember, hey, these people care us and we feel home. We, uh, we share the ownership committee that helping each other and connecting each other. So I think I talked too much and that's how briefly what we do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor. Yeah, I mean, I think you you really pointed out a lot of things that we can be thinking about and I, I'm mm-hmm. already generating lots of questions. So hopefully others will have some for you as well. I think it's really interesting that it took us 20 years to find you. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully the yeah. next 20 years more will be a lot of um, good, fruitful collaboration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super. Definitely. So the next one we have up is Dr. Courtney Owens from Kentucky State University in Kentucky. Um, and he is doing a lot of work with urban um, farming. He work, works with Newell, um, which is the National Urban Extension Leadership Program. Um, as you can see, he's, he's actually started a Kentucky a small farm conference that um, I actually am going to be speaking at in a couple of weeks. So he's got a lot of great things to say about working with um, black farmers in Kentucky. So I will pass it over to you, Dr. Owens. Just got to get you off mute, maybe. Can everybody hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Um, it's a pleasure being here today um, speaking on behalf of um, Sarah. And um, I appreciate the comments um, that was just mentioned. Those are, those are all areas that we need to focus on moving forward. But I want to tell you a little bit about what we do here at Kentucky State University. Um, I have several slides, but um, anybody that knows me, I can go through slides very quickly. So um, I do want to be a good steward of time. So here are some things I want to talk to you about. Um, a little bit about the overview of extension, because I think sometimes people forget um, about how we came into um, existence as 1890. Underserved and underrepresented audiences, breaking barriers of diversity, um, communication to stakeholders, and recommendations and strategies. So. Um, we have a hundred, let me go back off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember. We have 119 land grant institutions, um, 33 are tribal land grants, and then we have 19 that are 1890 historically black land grants. And those 1890s came into existence um, because of the second Morrell Act. And so here at Kentucky State, we are um, 1890. And so we tend to focus on those underserved populations, limited resource and minority populations, providing the research-based knowledge to that clientele. Next slide, please. So this is the map that I was just telling you about. And um, again, 1890s are located in the South. And so um, you can click on, I think it's a little. So that's where we are in Kentucky. And so um, because of the 19 institution, we worked collab- collaboratively on issues um, related to f- um, food insecurity, ag and natural resources, um, 4-H, et cetera. Next slide. So most often people use the term underserved, but this describes a particular demographic that has typically been without access um, to services offered to a particular group. And so, um, when we think about underserved audiences, that's that segment of a population that is um, usually um, overlooked or sometimes underrepresented when we do particular outreach and programs. Next slide. 
so that's our, this is our structure at Kentucky State. Uh, we have roughly 76 extension um, um, employees or educators with split appointments. And we have also um, county agents, extension associates, and state specialists. Next slide. So we are central, um, we are across the, um, the Kentucky, um, but primarily we're in the central and um, eastern part of the state, and we have area agents as well. Next slide. And so here are our areas, um, ag and natural resources, aquaculture, community resource development, family consumer science, nutrition, and forest youth development. What makes us unique um, about that? That's fine, that's fine. Uh, what makes us unique is that our programs um, go is primarily look at parity and how we work with those vulnerable populations. And so parity is, you know, is a condition um, which present, we're presented a, uh, a, a part of the, um, the demographic and you're looking at the percentage of that demographic and, and looking at race, gender and making sure like when you have extension programs, it fits that parity model. Next slide, keep going. So there are many barriers when it comes to reaching diverse audiences. Um, and oftentimes technology, broadband, communication gaps, and financial hardships and transportation are some of those areas. But there's, there's opportunities and there's, um, even though there's barriers, there's opportunities to reach these audiences. Um, oftentimes as extension educators, we have to, we have to think about out, um, ways and mechanisms to reach these audiences, creating resources, um, and reaching those changing demographics. Next slide, please. As we continue to grow, we know that um, the population is, um, is beginning to become more majority minority in certain um, areas in the United States. And so we have to identify those relationships, build a rapport. Not only that, we have to have educational resources that um, help those audiences in, re in regards to um, global food pandemics, or different types of issues relating to the home and, and agriculture. Next slide. So here at Kentucky State, um, I call this slide create intentional workforce because if you want to reach pop, um, populations that we are mandated to work with, you need to think outside of the box. So here at Kentucky State, we have a bilingual community resource development extension agent and, and her task has been very instrumental her, her, um, her efforts in Kentucky State has been very instrumental in reaching Hispanic populations. We have a Facebook page. We have um, information that um, attracts these audiences to our programs where we were in, in, in the past, we were not able to meet. So you think about, um, next slide, please. So you think about um, LEP, limited English proficiency. So you look at Title VI, this is a Civil Rights Act. We have to make sure that all programs, regardless of race or color or, or national origin, that they are accepted and welcome. And then we have opportunities to have those translators that's available that can translate the information to that clientele. Next slide. So all recent efforts um, in corporate extension um, looks different sometimes because we need to tailor our programming. And in this slide, I talk about uses of gratification, which is a communication theory. And oftentimes we forget that um, when we're marketing programs to our stakeholders, we need to identify the, um, so the media outlet that they're most comfortable with. And so sometimes we need to have TV ads, um, newsletters, et cetera, or even um, something you know, more old school, just getting up to, picking up the phone and calling individuals. Next slide. So these are some examples that we use. So when we're trying to reach minority or black farmers, we, um, we identify uh, issues that relates to them. And so for, for this flyer to the um, um, right here in the um, top left-hand corner, um, get the facts, that was for black and minority socially disadvantaged farmers. And so a lot of um, debt relief and um, USDA um, grants and funding was coming down the pipe, but we wanna explain to them how they can participate. Uh, we have a 4-H Ignite Youth Conference slider. And so one thing I'll talk about later is that you need to make sure that the audience that you're trying to reach, they need to rep be represented in the, the marketing material that you're using. And in the middle, we have um, our CRD um, 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 bilingual agent, Jessica, 
um, who also is marketing program to a particular um, group, a Hispanic group population. So you have to make that effort. And you can keep going, um, Dr. Benjamin, you can keep going again. And so um, welcoming nature, I think is important. And you having those first impressions with underserved audiences, um, you don't wanna to become too busy that you forget to engage with new people. And so that might look like um, um, needs assessment, identifying what stakeholders needs in the county or the state and making sure that you represent. But like I said before, uh, curriculums, uh, programs need to reflect the issues that you're trying to reach in those populations. Next slide. So I want to close by talking about equity and um, equity versus equality. Um, oftentimes, you know, we have underrepresented audiences that suffer um, uh, for lack of um, accommodations. And so when you think about what has happened with COVID and um, you think about um, kids that had to work remotely um, for a year. Some of those audiences didn't even have um, Wi-Fi or um, internet connections. And so we have to be mindful of that. We do not leave audiences and, and stakeholders um, in the past or behind when we have programs. So next slide. So for example, making sure that we take that extra effort, tailor programs, hire individuals that can reach the population or train individuals on culturally competent trainings that can help um, extension educators. Having programs that reach them, um, taking the time and effort to reach communities and working with partners and other organizations that work with diversity to increase participation in extension programs. Next slide. So we want to eliminate you know, the barriers and have opportunities um, for stakeholders. And so, you know, if you're looking on the slide and you see the, these, the, the pictures, you know, even though you give individuals the same thing, sometimes it may not be enough. Um, you may wanna have your 4-H uh, programs at the county extension office. Well, you might need to think about minority populations that may not have um, transportation to get to these programs, so they will not participate. So you wanna eliminate those slides. But then one thing I forgot to talk about is access. Even when you the, um, take down the barriers and you have things on an equal playing field, you have to make sure you have access and make sure that they welcome to the table to participate. Next slide. So communication to stakeholders matter, um, identifying the surveys, uh, environmental scans, identify those emerging issues because that's important for extension. So we know that we have state-of-the-art programming. Keep going, Dr. Benjamin. And so there's many things that we can do. We need to reach them where we are, have um, extension kits. Sometimes we have to send the um, educational kits to the, um, the clientele that we're reaching, and then we have to work from them, work with them in that aspect. Next slide. So um, extension educators should partner with organizations, we need to um, identify those needs, but we shouldn't have the, con the mindset that if we build it, they will come. We need to come to them. You know, Extension is the research arm of the university, so we need to reach out to them. Next slide. And we wanna be intentional when we're working with diverse audiences. We do not want to um, just think that because we have a program that they will come and participate. We need to target these programs. We need to create pipelines like 4-H, FFA, Manners, et cetera. Make it inclusive for everyone. Next slide. And so I would like to just end with this slide so uh, the next speaker can have um, opportunity as well. Corporate Extension has a non-discriminatory practice and policy that states all educational programs are available to clientele on a non-discriminatory base without regard to race, color, creed, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, gender and age dis disability. And I think sometimes we forget that, that we have to go that extra mile with working with our population. So with that, um, I will just say that, you know, it was a pleasure talking to the group today. I look forward to the questions. And just remember like 99% of the failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. So in my perspective, you know, we can't make excuses for leaving diversity 
um, diverse populations behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great, Dr. Owens. And I think, you know, interestingly enough, I didn't know that was Dr. Washington Carver that said that. Um, I've heard it before, but it's interesting to find out who is, are some of those quotes. I have tons of questions for you, as I'm sure others will do, but um, we'll pass this on to the next one. I think the next one is, um, is it Dr. Aaron Parker? Is it... Um, Aaron, Aaron Parker, they, they, yeah, and JDs don't You're, get doctors. I was going to say, <laughs> in, in Spanish, we say licenciada. So I'm going to say licenciada <laughs> Aaron Parker. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that works for me. And um, she is uh, with the director of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative out of the University of Arkansas, um, and is working a lot with tribal governments and Indigenous populations. So I'm going to pass it right on to you, Aaron. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so it's great to be here with everybody this afternoon. I'm really excited to discuss our work with uh, at IFAI with all of you. And I also really just wanted to applaud the two previous speakers. I've loved what both of you have shared. I'm really looking forward to Elsa's as well. As well. Um, Dr. Owens in particular, like when you got to barriers and opportunities, you probably saw me nod my head a lot. That's uh, very similar to a lot of the things that we address here at IFAI when we work with native farmers and ranchers. So if you want to go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about our organization. The Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative was founded in 2013 here at the University of Arkansas School of Law by then, uh, then Dean, uh, now Dean Emeritus, Stacey Leeds, who's a citizen of the, Chick the Cherokee Nation, and Janie Hip, who's a citizen of Chickasaw Nation. And if the name Janie Hip sounds familiar to you, she's been doing ag for a really long time, but she's currently the uh, general counsel for USDA. She went on to do that after she left here at IFAI and the Native American Ag Fund. So um, if you hear that name around, that's, that may be where you've heard it. Um, our mission here at IFAI has always been to empower tribal nations and advance healthy food systems and diversified economic development in Indian country. Um, we do that through a combination of a lot of different things, legal and policy research and analysis, programs and educational resources. Basically, at the end of the day, we exist to be a resource for all 574 federally recognized tribes and approximately 80,000 native farmers and ranchers across Indian country today. If you want to go to the next slide, our work is really diverse. And so I wanted to show you just a few pieces uh, today that I picked out a few pieces that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but I wanted to show you this whole snapshot of our work as well today. Um, because we work across food systems, our work is pretty broad. We do a lot of different things. We have a model tribal food and agriculture code a legal code that we developed for tribes that want to express their sovereignty in the space of food and agriculture, developing their own uh, agricultural law and policy to protect foods, traditional foods, traditional resources, uh, agriculture, uh, production and waterways, you name it, uh, it's probably in there. We tried to build a farm to fork uh, ag code in that project. We also do quite a bit of policy work through the Native Farm Coalition, where we're the research partner. We have a food safety outreach and training center that I'll talk about as well today. And of course, we have our Native Youth Summit that we do every single year for Indigenous youth who want to go into food systems careers. So we're bringing that next generation along as well. Um, definitely heard that loud and clear from Dr. Owens and could not agree more. Um, so we do a wide variety of programs really here at IFAI. Um, but before I get to our programs, if you go to the next slide and then the one after that, I wanted to share just a little bit with you about Indian country ag production for those who might not be familiar with Indian country or what native producers are growing and raising. Um, so if you want to switch to that next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the 2017 ag census. Um, I am a self-professed data nerd. Uh, I really love the story that these data are telling about agriculture in Indian country and what the story that these data are telling to me, especially over the last two national census of agriculture, is a story of deep investment from tribal nations and individual native farmers and ranchers in agriculture. You really see that in um, this particular statistic that 3% of all farms in the United States today are operated um, in part or solely by American Indian and Alaska Native um, folks. And for reference, just so you know, American Indian and Alaska Native people, if you look at the population census, make up about 2% of the total U.S. population. So pretty significant agricultural investment from Indian country. And if you go to the next slide, you can see some more exciting to me and hopefully everyone else thinks about Indian country ag. This is all from the 2017 census again. And what this showed was an increase across pretty much all counts 
for native farmers and ranchers from the 2012 Ag Census. And that's growth that I think myself and my colleagues who work in Indian country are seeing on the ground, but it was really amazing to see it reflected in the data. So you can see a 7% increase in the number of farms that were counted with a native producer. And if you drill down into the data, you can see even some more significant increases in specific types of farming in Indian country, fruit and tree nut farming, sheep and goat, beef cattle, greenhouse and floriculture all rose pretty significantly from 2012 to 2017 if you look at those counts. That was really exciting to see. If you go to the next slide, you can see that all of that shakes out to a market value of about three and a half billion dollars in raw agricultural products that are grown, raised, harvested by native producers every single year. Um, and if you go to the next slide and then maybe flip through to the one after that, you can kind of see visually where native farmers are. We work nationally at the initiative. So we exist to serve all native farmers and ranchers across the country, but we do spend quite a bit of time in these places where you can see those deep blue pockets. That, that's where there's high concentrations of native farmers and ranchers um, located under, just understandably on tribal lands in their tribal communities. Most of the time, these pockets are, re are reflecting that. You can see in Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Montana, like we work a, a lot in a lot of those places with a lot of uh, tribal nations in those particular areas in the work that we do. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, I will tell you a little bit about our work. Um, let's start with our food safety work um, along with the Intertribal Ag Council and the University of Arizona Tribal Extension Program or FERTEC program. We formed the Tribal Food Safety Alliance last year and our mission there is to develop culturally relevant curriculum and training for food safety for native producers and food businesses. We have a cooperative agreement with the FDA to do that. We began back in 2016 and then formally set up this alliance with a new agreement back in 2020. Um, we've been doing food safety training in Indian country since 2016. I'm a lead trainer under the Produce Safety Rule, uh, Produce Safety Alliance curriculum, and we're actually working with them right now on a modified version for Indian country that will take into account some specific unique legal complexities of producing food that moves across multiple jurisdictions. Um, between tribal jurisdiction and federal jurisdiction, as well as culturally competent pieces for training and trainers as well. Um, next slide talks a little bit about our strategic planning services for tribal nations and tribal producers, particularly for tribes that are developing their own tribal departments of agriculture or entities to house their food systems investment for, or for individual native producers who are looking to either start or scale up their operations. We have a series of curriculum and training that we've rolled out over the last calendar year for those things. We had designed those to be implemented in person because that's always the, the gold standard for working in Indian country is actually be in communities and be in person. But we've done the best that we could during the pandemic to be able to reach folks with the understanding and awareness that we too face the same kind of broadband and uh, communication challenges when we're working with folks in really rural and remote populations as well. So we're excited to be slowly getting back out into the field um, starting in December to be actually do trainings in person, but that's kind of what we've been doing over the last year. And the last but not least on the next slide, you can see a little bit more about our research partner work with the Native Farm Book Coalition, which is the largest ever collaborative effort of over 170 tribal nations in Indian country to come together and look at opportunities for Indian country and native producers in the farm bill. And a big piece of that work for us is working directly with native farmers and ranchers and tribal leaders to help build coalition priorities to see like what's going wrong. Like where, where are the gaps? Like where's policy failing you to where are these programs failing to serve you and how could legislative change help fix that? And once those changes are made, uh, like in the 2018 Farm Bill, there were 63 tribal specific provisions implemented in that final legislation, which had never happened before and was really exciting. Once that happens, we then work with USDA to make sure those things are implemented in a good way that actually serves native farmers and ranchers in the way that was intended and also communicate all that back to Indian country as well so that those programs are able to be taken advantage of by the people they're supposed to be serving. Um, so with that, if you want to go to the very last slide with my contact info, I'd, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for ELSA. Um, so I just want to echo absolutely 100% what Dr. Owen said about barriers and challenges. We also deal with those same technology access, broadband communication gaps issues when we're working with our um, native farmers and ranchers. Relationships are so key in Indian country too, and partnerships are so critical. I pulled together a few resources and best practices for working in Indian country here, but I'm going to close out and leave time uh, with Elsa and just kind of leave you with that thought about relationship piece because I think that that's going to be really, really critical to making sure that Indigenous farmers and ranchers are continually served by extension going forward. So I'm looking forward to the questions as well, and I will hand it back to you, Dr. Benjamin. 
Thank you so much, Erin. And yeah, I kind of wanted to stay on that one page because there were some really good um, uh, best practices and we may want to go back to that at some point. But yeah, those were those were really good. Thank you for putting those in. And we will definitely, this is being recorded if everyone didn't know that. Um, so it, it is there, we can go back and freeze frame that and you can take a screenshot if you need it. So thanks again. And um, last but not least, and actually, um, we got this idea actually from you, Dr. Sanchez. I, we read your article and we um, talked about how uh, your the article that you wrote on you know reaching Hispanic farmers was so um, well done. We thought this is what we need to do, but we need to do it for you know many different um, racial groups. And so. Um, Thank you for being the impetus for, for the panel. And we're so excited that you could even be here um, on this with us. So I'm gonna pass this over to you. You're from the rival state of the, of the Pennsylvania State Nittany Lions, but um, we sure are happy to have you on. So thanks again. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, I, I'm Elsa Sanchez, and I'm going to talk about some of our um, efforts through our extension service to connect with the Latinx community. If you need to contact me at any time, the easiest way is through my email, which is um, right there on the screen. Next slide, please. A lot of what I'm going to talk about is from a couple of projects that we've been doing. One is the based on the article that was just mentioned. And then we also have a Latinx agriculture network, which is uh, made up of faculty, staff, and students who are also working to connect with the Latinx community. Next slide, please. So some of the lessons that we've learned, it's gonna be a lot of um, repeating of what's already been said. Um, so building trust is foundational. Um, we've taken the time to do this in the past with traditional audiences. We need to take the time to do this with um, Latinx and other communities as well. Um, there's a segment of the Latinx community that either only speaks Spanish or prefers learning in Spanish. And so having resources in Spanish is an important component of connecting with this audience. And I, I think um, Dr. Owens mentioned the importance of reaching out and partnering with other groups um, who have been successful at connecting with um, uh, Latinx communities. That's also um, really important um, here. Next slide, please. I'm being intentional. Dr. Owens, I was going to say, you can't build it and they will come. That's, it's the exact same thing. Um, you know, you have to be very intentional. It's, it's a situation where you have to build that relationship in order for it to uh, work out. It's more than just um, creating something and expecting folks to come. And the bottom line is that trust is important. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to talk about a couple of things um, a little bit more in depth. Um, first, with cultural competency trainings, this is a picture from a farmer event. Um, we're talking, we went to the farmer talking about uh, weed management, um, but it's really important, I think, with um, all new communities, but with the Latinx community in particular, to do cultural competency trainings. Um, next slide, please. So for example, um, the Latinx community is huge. We are a huge group of people and there are different ways that different people identify and it's really important to take the time to understand that. Um, there's Hispanic, um, Latino, which are used interchangeably. I'm gonna yeah. use it interchangeably, but they really do have different meanings and it's important to understand that. Um, it's also important to understand that not everybody in um, the Latinx community likes either one of these names. They might identify with um, their uh, country or their family's country of origin, like Mexican or Cuban or Puerto Rican. So it's just the whole idea that we're not a monolith, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at with this slide. Next slide, please. We're a very diverse group. It's an, we're an ethnic group, right? So we can span all races. I happen to be of the white race and I'm also um, Hispanic. My neighbor is American Indian, he's Hispanic. My nephew's um, Asian American Hispanic. So race is independent of, um, of being Hispanic. We are born in the United States and all over the world. And actually one of the biggest myths regarding the Latinx community is that most of us are immigrants. In fact, only 35% of the US Latinx population are immigrants and 65% of us were actually born here. Um, and the reason that's kind of important is because it affects our language. Um, so we speak English and we um, speak Spanish and you know any other language you can think of too. But the majority of us speak English. 
um, even among uh, the immigrant um, uh, Latinx population, 40% um, speak English. And if you look at American born um, uh, Hispanic people, 95% speak English. And it's been documented by the third generation that you've lived in the United States as someone who is um, a Latinx, we lose the Spanish because honestly, where do you need Spanish in the United States? You can get by your whole life without knowing Spanish. And so um, I think that's one of the, the big uh, takeaways that I wanted to give you is that we don't all speak Spanish. We're various ages, various levels, anything you can, differences you can think of, you can find it in our community. So next slide, please. Um, this is um, from a study that was done in kind of the apple growing, major apple growing area in Pennsylvania, where they um, were um, surveying farm workers. And here's just a few things that came out. Over 60% have family farms in their native countries. And there's more things, but I'm just going to focus in on that. I don't, this is a skilled workforce. And I don't think that they're necessarily honored for bringing that to, um, to the United States in, in their work. And so I think that this type of cultural competency training is going to go a long way to help building those relationships with the Latinx um, community. Um, another thing I wanted to say is that there seems to be a misperception that if you are um, Hispanic and you are in agriculture, you're a farm worker. We're actually any level in the uh, agricultural industry, you can find Hispanic people. And um, I just wanted to share, I, I was at this talk and there was this farmer from California, Latina. And one of the things that she said is when she takes her products to market, um, the customers think that she's the farm worker and her white farm workers are the farmer. And so this is another area I think we can do um, cultural competency training. Next slide, please. Creating welcoming spaces is also important. This is a talk that I'm giving in central Pennsylvania. It could be anywhere. They all kind of look like this. And just for a moment, imagine walking into this space as um, someone who is um, Latina, right? You can see on the wall, there's a picture of a bunch of white men. Um, it's just, this is a description that I, that I read that I think fits. It's like walking into a sports bar in Pittsburgh with a Dallas Cowboy jersey on. You feel unwelcome, you don't feel safe, you don't. You feel like you're being watched. And so there are simple things that we can do to make spaces more welcoming, more um, inclusive. Um, next uh, slide, please. Creating awareness, um, I, that was mentioned before, you know, there are folks that because we haven't connected with them, aren't aware that we are here and want to make these connections. And so being intentional about where we advertise and how we advertise is important for creating awareness. Next slide, please. And then there is a segment of the community that does need um, Spanish language resources in order to be successful. Um, this is a quote from, it wasn't Spanish, we translated to English, just to show how important that that is for the uh, Spanish speakers. Next slide. And this is uh, my last slide. We um, um, organized, we being extension, um, a Spanish session at the Mid-Atlantic Food and Vegetable Convention, which is this big regional convention that takes place here in Pennsylvania. And we surveyed the attendees and asked them how they feel to have extension events that are created specifically for them. And these are some of the things that they said, you know, it makes me feel good that organizers care about the, including the Hispanic community, you know, et cetera. And so I just wanted to bring this in just to show that um, as evidence that, you know, this work works, you know, that we can build this relationship and there's a big payoff from it. Also, the things that I've been talking about, um, I've been talking specifically about the Latinx community, but I think since I got to be last, I got to see what everybody else said. It could apply to all of these communities that we've talked about, most of them. So that's that's how I wanted to end. Thank you. Thank you so much to all four of you. Really appreciate it. Um, appreciate all that you have to offer. It's very interesting, all the connections, like you were saying. Um, we do have uh, some questions in the chat. And if people have other questions, please um, feel free to, to put them there. I will try to get through these as um, we go along. I Hopefully there are other people that would like to um, offer. Um, Anna Catherine, who is our first webinar speaker um, from Cornell said, to your point about Hispanic versus Latinx, Elsa, I have two Latino, Latina extension colleagues 
who hate the term Latinx. And I've heard that as well. Um, my, my child is actually non-binary and uh, they like to go by Latine. Um, so that is like another whole uh, realm. Thoughts on that? Because I think that's a really interesting one. I think some of um, my husband hates Latin Latinx. He's always like, no, I'm Latino. Yeah, I, that is a, a real issue. Um, and and I think that goes to just knowing your audience and, and what their preferences are. Um, because some people like Latinx. Um, I'm okay with Latinx. Some people don't like Hispanic because, you know, well, the root of it's not great for some people. And, and so, yeah, you just have to know your audience. Yeah. If anyone wants to unmic themselves and ask questions, please feel free. I see Michael Wilcox, you've got to have a question. <laughs> well, I guess to I've been thinking a lot about this stuff as of late. I'm working on an article right now. And, you know, I think the Latinx thing is an interesting um, uh, discussion and it, it brings in the whole concept of intersectionality, right? And so as you think about intersectionality and what that means in terms of agriculture, what it means in terms of economic development, what it means in terms of community development, which aspects of intersectionality are sort of binding at which time is one of the questions that I suppose that we need to, to ask ourselves. There was a great article in the New York Times yesterday talking about the issue Issue associated with the words that we use and the challenge that that brings and how certain political parties are now identifying words to go after people about like they're trying to ban them they're trying to say that oh you're subscribing to this or that because you're using these particular words so I guess my point is language is important but in terms of agriculture and the work that we're trying to do what elements of intersectionality are binding at, at which time and do folks have do some of our speakers have some good examples of when maybe it shifts from a racial discussion versus an ethnic discussion versus a orientation discussion or a gender discussion, you know, which aspects of intersectionality are binding and how do we determine that as educators, as professionals, as uh, agriculturalists? I, I would just say this um, really quickly. It, I guess it depends on the gatekeepers and who is writing the narrative because if you think about African Americans, our term, our name, and in, in the census was not always African Americans, you know. And so we have um, went several. We was colored people, you know. It's other th other topics that we have. Black. Most people want to be considered black, and so you're seeing the census trying to catch up. But it's who is labeling us, and it goes back to um, um, Dr. Um, Elsa point is that you may want some people may go by a, a, a title but others may not like that title and so and 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 it's hard to group a, a group of individuals together when it comes to things like that because it can be offensive to some when you you label individuals with a particular name for a group of, or a segment of a population so I have a question. This kind of goes out to Pastor, um, also to Dr. Sanchez and to Aaron. Um, and it was the fact that I think a lot of people of color are looked at as farm workers and they don't have a tradition, especially like Pastor, what you were saying, many of the people that you work with have come from a tradition of agriculture. They, they've farmed before. Um, Elsa, you were saying the same thing. And Erin, I would even attest that it's the same thing with indigenous populations. You know, this increase is, has to do with that. It's almost like we have, uh, as a white population relegated many people of color to being workers. And even Dr. Owens, you know, you know, going back to slavery times, um, many of the, of the people that were slaves came from very strong agricultural traditions. They were selected for that. Um, how do we change that narrative? I think that is one of the things that I struggle with because I think we do think of, oh, they're the migrant workers, right? They're just here for a few months and then they're gone. Um, or pastor, you know, thinking, you know, of Myanmar coming from, you know, the traditions that you came from, how do we start to celebrate those wonderful traditions rather than looking at it as these are farm workers? I think that is a big problem. I didn't mention in that study, but 
um, farm workers don't even in that study didn't even want to be called farm workers because it's so stigmatized in the United States. And so I think it goes back to language and it, and it goes back to cultural competency trainings. And I think the work needs to start internally um, before, you know, we can do a good job with the outreach part. Pastor and Dr. Owens or Aaron, do you have anything to say with, I, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this. Uh, the Myanmar populations are pretty new and uh, heavy level production, marketable productivity is not that much. Volume is very low. And there is an assistant program where we can land, rent land or any loan system where we can help them do and then help them do uh, farmer markets sales. And in Myanmar, Burmese community, I don't see negative perception about being a farmer. And mostly they work at warehouse and uh, uh, factory. And they, some of, I know they ask me where I can get land. I don't know either. <laughs> so buy, have money and buy, that's it. And so uh, other Asian ethnic group like Vietnamese, Hmong, and some did that very good. Uh, Vietnamese, they did good job. They've been here for a while, maybe 50 years since the Vietnam War. Myanmar community are uh, pretty uh, new and uh, farming, particularly other ethnic groups. In Myanmar, there are many, many multiple ethnic groups, small, minor groups. So I think this is what to help them do, explore next level from the backyard gardening to next level, organic gardening for their productivity marketable level and they would love to do that. I know people who ask me, there are some who, who wants to do that next. And quality food production in the small community, that's I think uh, what to do that. Like I discovered that farm, Native American farm production, a billion worth of dollar, wow, that's great, you know. And I know that if we can help them do the project in a small scale business owner become self, uh, owner ownership in business that also uh, are in many area aspects of life that the uh, the American group will improve that. I know pretty well there are people who want to have that, but there is no assistant uh, small business scale level right now. What I know is this big yard gardening uh, level that what we've been working on here. Super. Anna Catherine, did you have a question? Did you raise your hand. Yes, I do. I'm, I'm curious to ask Dr. Sanchez, but really all four of you, um, where are you sourcing cultural competency training? Or where are you finding good places to, to access that? We have a um, um, DEI professional in our college, and um, she's developed um, some trainings around that. And then some of it is it is just individuals who are interested, right, who will put together something. Okay. So. And, and I would just chime in and say that um, there is a lot of um, leadership programs um, that's developed that's focusing on DEI and how it affects um, the land grant mission. And so um, I'm trying to think of the organization. It's just, oh, I, can, I can't even think the name, the name of the lady, but um, I think it's Southern Rural Development. Um, Rachel, that's her name. She has develop um, a learning circles and, um, and working groups as it relates to DEI. And that has been important to leaders and not only leaders, but um, extension staff as well. Michael put in the chat, Rachel Wellborn. Is that the one, Courtney? Yes, that's, that's correct. And to a question you mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Benjamin, I think you have to change the narrative, especially with um, African-American farmers because as you mentioned too, and you alluded to um, slavery and the, and the historical aspect of that, a lot of um, African-American families, black families, they deter their kids to go into agriculture. And so because of what has happened in the past. So if you can have that opportunity to change their mindset, and I think about um, Rogers' diffusion of innovation, where you can have trialability 
and adaptability and you can see different things that agriculture is just not about X, Y, and Z. It's so much more. So, yeah, great. That's yeah. a really good point. Erin, did you want to chime in there? Yeah, I did. I, as far as cultural competency goes, uh, we actually develop quite a bit of our own materials around them. That's part of what we're doing for food safety, especially for people who want to do food safety training in Indian country. Um, we're working really closely with Intertribal Agriculture Council on that, um, trying to put together some cultural competency materials for trainings. We also rely, or I, I send people sometimes to um, Illuminative is the name of the organization. Uh, they have a whole series of educational resources about working in Indian country. Uh, they've got some really great, there's, I, I clipped a bit for my slide too. I didn't uh, spend a lot of time on it, but I did add a note about language because um, as Dr. Sanchez was talking about, like calling people what they want to be called is really important. Um, and when you're talking about Indian country, there are people who prefer native, there are people who prefer indigenous, there are people who prefer American Indian. Um, I mean, when you're talking about the general term, I always tell people, if you know the name of someone's actual tribe, like it's good to say that. But if you're just talking generally in broad strokes, call people what you, not what you think they should be called, but what they want to be called. So there's some good resources about things like that. Um, they've got a, a really good publication called Changing the Narrative about Native Americans. And that's usually where I send folks to, to look at some cultural competency pieces just broadly for Indian country. And if you wanna know about um, the interplay between tribal nations and how tribal sovereigns interact with state governments and the federal government, the National Congress for American Indians has a really good pub on that too. Thank you, that was all super helpful. Uh, hopefully um, people will, uh, rewind this recording and get some of that stuff or you can type it in the chat, Erin, thank yeah. you. You're welcome to share my slides too. Okay, good. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important we're, we're finishing this up, but I wanna make sure that everyone that's on here, a lot of people that are on here are either extension, NRCS, you know, SWCD, things like that, that are out working with our populations. And I think it's easy for us to say, oh, we live in Indiana, rural Indiana, where there aren't a lot of Latinos, there aren't any Native Americans, there aren't any Asian Americans, there aren't any Black um, farmers that are that are working. And the reality is they're, they, they are here. There are lots of people. There is a diverse group of people that are farming. And um, we have to be intentional. I heard that today. Um, I heard we have to build, be willing to build relationships. And that means Sometimes it means going into, you know, the local grocery store and talking to people, where did they get their vegetables and things like that from not the Kroger's, but the, the small um, uh, local kind of uh, uh, grocery stores that service um, maybe Asian population or serve the Latino population. So I think it's really important that as a group, we need us in extension need to start um, being much more intentional about our efforts in reaching populations. And I just wanna make, make that as our, our, our goal for 2022, to take into consideration all of these great words of wisdom from this amazing group of panelists. Um, I'm, you know, we are getting to the end of the times. So I just wanna let each of you say one last thing before we head out. Um, is there any other words of wisdoms you'd like to um, express on us so that we can be better stewards and better, um, uh, connectors and educators to our population. So pastor, you want to go first? Uh, the South side Indianapolis chin ethnic group Burmese has unique visitable you never fall, find anywhere in the world. They call it some top. <laughs> and you, you, I think there are several four or five items you, you can find nowhere in the world. It's only grow in Myanmar and they brought the seed here. Try it uh, or just text me. I'll send you the, the sample so you, you can try if you like it. <laughs> and we have, yeah, we have uh, multiple Burmese food. Uh, so if you hang around Southside Indy, just try. It. Uh, you love that. So thank you for having me today. That is a great word of wisdom. We should all reach out to new uh, places to eat food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doc Dr. Owens? Well, thank you for having me today. Um, this is a topic that's dear to my heart because um, a lot of people talk about growing up in extension, growing up in 4-H. And so that's not my reality. And I tell people I stumbled into extension, literally. Um, and so... For the next generations, my goal is to make sure that we have extension programs that serve everyone. 
And I wanted to keep talking yeah. about everyone because you may not be in a, a location like um, Dr. Benjamin said that you might have this um, population, but you do have underserved populations and give them the opportunity to change their lives through extension related programs that's tailored to fit their needs. Thank you all, the panelists was excellent. And thank you for just um, inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Owens, that was great. And you are right, there are underserved populations all over. I, I completely agree. Aaron. Sure, so thanks everybody. I'd like to thank each of my fellow panelists. I have really enjoyed learning from you today and hearing about your work and uh, what you're doing. Um, I would echo uh, what my previous two panelists have said for sure. I would also say uh, there's there's really no one size fits all solution in, in Indian country. So if you're working in Indian country, you're gonna learn a lot of, about um, a lot of different ways to do things according to in, in individual native producers. And I would encourage you to reach out to um, them in the ways that have been outlined here today for sure. And think about those partnerships and those relationships um, as you're doing that. If that's something that you are interested in doing and you do want to partner, I'd be happy to talk with, it, with you more about that for sure. Um, and since it's Native American Heritage Month here in November, I would also say if you're looking to source food for your table directly from Native producers, you can go to indianag.org and our good friends at the Intertribal Agriculture Council maintain a producer directory. And you can order delicious indigenous produced food and get it delivered right to your door. So just a quick plug. Thanks for letting me do that here. So thanks. Great for words of wisdom, Erin. <laughs> Thank you. And last but not least, Elsa, you get to finish us off. You are the one that started all of this unbeknownst to you, but we would love to hear your last words of wisdom. And I'm sorry, we're a little bit over for all you that have a four o'clock on your schedules. I just wanted to say quickly, sometimes I hear that folks are afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing when working with a new community. Just do it. I think in the end, everybody um, appreciates the effort. Super, thank you all again. Thank you, the four panelists. You guys were amazing. Anna Catherine, thanks for being on again. Our next one is Skylar, is in December. I hope you all can join us again, but thank you. And yeah, excellent. I cannot express my gratitude enough to all four of you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>